Hey folks, welcome back to another lesson and this one we're going to look at an experiment to measure half-life. Now, unfortunately we used to do this as an experiment in class, um, but they've actually taken all the radioactive sources from us, so it's one we're going to talk about and there is a simulation that I can show you when we get back into class, okay? And this is something entirely new, we've not done this before in S3, so please make sure you follow what's happening, okay? So we're going to start by defining what half-life is. We're then going to describe and analyse an experiment to measure the half-life, and we're going to describe how to get the corrected count for a half-life experiment. So, one of the questions you might ask is, how long does radiation last? Now, in a previous lesson, I talked about Chernobyl and how the, the town around Chernobyl was going to be radioactive for at least 20,000 years. Okay, so uh, how did we know this, and how can we work out how long a source will stay radioactive. Okay, so a wee reminder for you about what radioactive decay is. Remember, it's an atom that spontaneously and randomly breaks apart, releasing radiation. And because it's spontaneous and random, we can't really predict it. However, if we look at a very large sample of decaying atoms, we can do some statistics on it. We can predict statistically how long it's going to take to break down completely. So here's a new definition for you, and it's this one here. It's called half-life, and the symbol for a half-life is a half followed by the lambda symbol. And you have to know this definition. The half-life is the time for the activity of a source to fall to half its original value. It's got units of seconds, minutes, hours, or years, etc. Now, to give you an idea of what half-life is, because the definition doesn't always seem to be obvious, if you have an activity of a radioactive source as 100 becquerels, and it takes 10 years for it to fall to 50 becquerels, then the half-life would be uh, 10 years. So what that means is, in other words, every 10 years, that activity will drop by half. So after the first 10 years, the activity is 50 becquerels. In the next 10 years, it would be 25 and the next 10 years, it would be 12 and a half, so on and so forth. So what would the activity be after another 10 years? It would be 25 becquerels. So what you're doing every half-life is you're dividing your activity by half. And if you think about that carefully, it means technically your radioactive source is always going to be radioactive because you could keep dividing by half and half and half and half until it gets really, really small, couldn't you? Okay, so here's the experiment to measure half-life. Okay, so the setup's fairly simple. We have a GM tube and a counter. So the counter measures how many counts there are per second. We've got a timer to measure how long we're going to take for each reading. So we start by measuring the background radiation. This is really important. This is done by measuring the count for one minute, then calculating the activity using A is equal to N over T. Okay. This background radiation must be subtracted from the results to give the corrected count. Now it's called the corrected count because if you think about it, the background radiation is always there in the background, isn't it? So if we don't actually subtract it from our readings, it means our readings are always going to be higher because it's taking in the background radiation. One way to think about that is imagining you're trying to measure the sound level, but someone in the background is playing their music. So that means your sound levels are going to be higher because you're taking in that background sound as well. Okay, so another reason why we have to do this is because, again, remember, radiation is random, so background radiation can change between days. So what that means is you could measure the background radiation today, and if you made the same measurement at the same time the following day, you, get, could, you could get a totally different value of the background radiation. Okay, so for the experiment, we're going to use a radioactive source, source called protactinium-234. We've got a GM tube connected to a rate meter, so that just counts the activity for us. And then we've got a timer, so we know what time points to take a reading for. So the idea is that the timer lets us measure time, the rate meter measures the activity. And what we do is we take readings from the rate meter every 10 seconds. This is then plotted into a line graph to allow us to work out the half-life. So I'll run through this experiment for you when we get back into class. So you would write your results down where you've got your activity, which is in counts per second, and you've got the corrected count, because remember, we measured the background radiation first, 
So to get the corrected count, remember, we subtract the background from each of these activity counts that we're going to write down. We're taking readings every 10 seconds, and the experiment is going to last for about five minutes or so. Once we get the results and we've corrected it, this is the type of graph that you're going to get. Now notice this is in time in days, but if you were to plot it, it would be time in seconds. And we get this lovely kind of curved graph here. And um, you might be asking, well, how do we calculate or get the half-life from this graph? Now, you have to be able to do this. So you must understand what I'm going to show you and you must be able to do it. And hopefully when we get back into class, we'll do some of these so you get practice at it. So to get the half-life from the graph, what you do is the following. First of all, you pick an activity reading that you didn't plot, that's always the case, and you find the corresponding time. So for example, let's pick 60, and the time is roughly about there. So that's about 0.9 of a day for argument's sake, okay? And I would actually draw this in on your graph so you can get the most accurate time possible. The second thing is, find the activity uh, of one and find the corresponding time, or half the activity, sorry. So what that means is, if we started at 60, then find half the activity of one means it's gonna be at 30. And then we find the corresponding time. Again, that's about maybe 2.9. And then the final step is, half-life will be the final time minus the initial time. So it would be 2.9 minus 1.9, which is about two days. And that's the half-life of our source. Okay, just to show you uh, some examples of what half-lives are and also how they can be used, especially in medicine. Okay, we've got a table here that shows you the different radioactive sources called radioisotopes. And we've got the half-lives of these, and you can see they range from anything less than a second up to billions of years. And then I'm going to show you some of the applications. Okay, and the application depends, well, one of the factors depends on is the half-life. So for example, Tracers are used in medicine to detect changes in the body system. Now, remember, a tracer is a radioactive chemical that you inject into somebody's body, and that radioactive chemical will then go around the body, and because the radiation hopefully can pass out of the body, you can then follow that radiation or trace that radiation around the body. And it's really good uh, for looking at blockages. For example, you might have a blockage in your bowels or in your blood circulation system. So that allows you to see it or detect it. OK, now, because these radioactive tracers have to be injected into the body, we don't want them to be too short because otherwise we'd never detect them. We don't want them to be too long because, remember, this patient will have to leave the hospital and go home and they'll be interacting with their friends and families. So ideally, we want one which is either in minutes or hours. So ideally, we would want to use either sodium or iodine. Now, I would even argue that iodine, not iodine, sorry, is probably even too long a half-life because if you think about it, that person is going to wait at least maybe over a month or two before the radioactive level gets low enough for them to be not that dangerous. So really, I would probably say the 15 hours would be the ideal one. What do we do with these ones here, which have an incredible long half-life? Well, sadly, the only thing we can do is to bury them underground. We usually cover it with cement and other kind of materials to act as a shield. And we put up warning signs to warn people not to approach it. Otherwise, they might get a big dose of radiation. However, a really interesting question is, if this lasts for so long, then it's very likely that even when human beings are no longer around, bearing in mind civilization has only been around for maybe a couple of thousands of years, how do we warn future generations of radioactive waste that's been stored. Okay, how do we stop them from interacting with it and picking up horrible diseases?